Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Expert Marketing Tips for Alt Protein Businesses webinar. So I am Valerie Pang, and I'm the Innovation Associate at the Good Food Institute Asia Pacific, otherwise known as GFI APAC. So before we get started, I have a few things to share with you. So first of all, for whoever is new to the work of the Good Food Institute, we are an international nonprofit organization that is developing the roadmap for sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. To do that, we identify the most effective solutions, we mobilize resources and talent, and we mobilize partners across the food system to make all proteins accessible, affordable, and most importantly, delicious. Second, this webinar will be recorded. So we will post a recording on our YouTube channel and we'll email a recording of the webinar within the next few days to those who have registered. So if you missed part of it or didn't catch something, no worries, we will send it to you later on so you can revisit it. So the agenda for our session today is as follows. Our speakers, Bridget and Tanya, will be giving a presentation for about 40 minutes. And this will be followed by a 15-minute Q&A session with the audience. So for the Q&A session, um, please type your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat. So this will help us to keep track of them more easily. Um, also, to do something a bit different for this webinar, I might allow for the participants to be able to talk directly to the speaker after to ask your question so that there's a bit more of an interactive component. So with that, I shall get started with our expert marketing tips for all protein businesses webinar. And we have invited the Healthy Marketing Team, which is an international specialist agency for innovation, marketing, and branding in food health and sustainability. So they'll be sharing with us all protein market trends, consumer and product insights, and marketing tips on creating a successful brand in APAC. So it is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker, Bridget Zeller, is a senior strategies consultant with more than 27 years of extensive international experience in the F&B industry, um, especially in Asia. She has led local, regional, and global director positions in multinational food companies such as Nestle, Unilever, Danone, and Fonterra, and she brings extensive experience in branding and marketing and strategic business development. Our second speaker, Tanya Thon Wang Nichaku is an insights expert based in Bangkok. Her expertise includes health sciences, consumer markets, and health food businesses. She is an insights expert in determining the sweet spot between consumer needs, trends, and food markets. And she has worked on plant-based product development in the B2C and B2B markets in Asia. So without further ado, I will now hand over the time to Bridget and Tanya for their presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie, for the nice introduction. We are very happy to be here today with uh, GFI, but also with all the participants, because our mission is also to create change together. So first, uh, a quick, uh, a little bit quick introduction about uh, what is uh, HMT. So as uh, Valerie said, uh, we, it's, it's an international brand builders in food health and sustainability, which exists six, uh, since uh, 15 years and supports change maker in the food and nutrition industry. So a large experience in, uh, in 60 uh, countries. But we have experience in a plant based from the origin uh, 12 years ago, uh, we had uh, in Sweden, the case of uh, Otli, who wanted to move from Sweden to an international expansion. And HMT helped at this time uh, to develop the new platform of Otley. And one of the quotes from the owner at this time was, we had world-class science, but we didn't know how to tell our story to create the value we saw in the company. And I will say that today, 12 years later, when we think about the booming and the growing category that is alternative, Alternative protein, I would say that creating added value is very important. So since this time, uh, we have uh, experience of working with different uh, plant-based uh, companies, startup B2B, B2C, mainly in Europe, but also in Asia, and in Singapore with uh, a company, very, I would say, game-changing company, which is What If Food, which is based uh, here in, in, uh, in Singapore. So before uh, we enter in the topic, 
uh, of your 10 uh, marketing tips, uh, we would like to define a framework for successful growth. So this is a four factors methodology who help you to get the right for the first time with the speed to success and hopefully to avoid or minimize failure. So what is it? It's a very pragmatic approach where you connect the dots between the consumer, the trends, the category, and the brand. And by connecting the dots, it gives you a strategic framework for innovation and brand positioning. It's like a checking list. So since uh, Oatly and, all, and um, our experience in more than uh, 12 years uh, in, uh, in this plant-based uh, field, and also a collective, uh, I would say, uh, knowledge and understanding of the category and the complexity as well of the category. And having work on the case of Woodley, like you see here at the bottom of this slide, moving from an undifferentiated brand, which is just no lactose intolerance story, to a no car generation story for lifestyle consumers, we have collected, uh, I would say, insights. We have collected case. And we are very happy to share with you these 12 marketing uh, tips, which are actually uh, a point of view, but of course it's not exclusive of other things that you can, you can think. So today the agenda is about APAC. So what's happening in APAC in the plant-based market? So we will talk quickly, uh, because it's not the main topics, about market data. The second point, it would be, why is it happening? So Tanya will explain us what are the consumer uh, or brand insight who drive the market. And third, the big topic uh, of today, which is a how, how to make it happen, which will be the 10 winning tips to be successful in alternative uh, protein. So let us start first uh, by what is happening in the APAC plant-based market. So it's not new. Everyone on, uh, on this call is based uh, mainly in Asia. So you know by heart that plant-based is part of the traditional diet and the local culture of Asian consumers, and it exists for a long time. Soya and peanuts have been traditional milk for Asia for mass and traditional uh, consumers. And if you have been in, uh, in the market for a long time, you, you have seen the growing consumption of, uh, of dairy with income growth, but also because it was perceived as more modern and uh, as well more healthy. So if we take the, the second one, which is food, can you go back to the last slide? If we take food, tempeh, seitan have been cultural norm for uh, centuries in the region from Indonesia to China, either for culinary reasons or for uh, religion regions. But what's happening now in, uh, in the market in uh, Asia is that since five to six years, uh, there is, you are, uh, you are locked, Tanya. Can you go? Yes. Since five or six years, there is trendy plant-based food and shops which are opening the door for transformation change in the food system. And here we can uh, really uh, highlight the crucial role uh, and pivotal role that food service and B2B companies are doing because in Asia, they are the, really the first channel to introduce and educate the curious modern consumers on trendy plant-based food and beverage experience. And here you see uh, pictures from Singapore, Thailand, or, uh, or China. Next. So all these drivers can explain why uh, actually Asia is still uh, a growing platform for uh, plant uh, protein and alternative protein behind the uh, US and, and Europe, but still uh, showing opportunity to grow and, uh, and white space. Next. So, but when we look at Asia and, and uh, you are based in different country and you can see that being in China or being in Thailand or being in, uh, in Vietnam is not the same story. So it's why uh, when we look at the numbers of Euromonitor, they tell us that the five markets which are more important are uh, China, Japan, Hong Kong, and, uh, and Singapore, 
in terms of uh, maturity of the market and growing aspect. So if we look at uh, the meat alternative uh, market, it's, uh, it's very huge. But I would say here just one point on Thailand, not because Tha Tanya is here, but also because uh, the Thai government is also pushing a lot the future food roadmap to support innovation uh, behind alternative protein. But definitely Greater China is, uh, is dominating. Next. So now if we look at uh, the meat, not the meat, but the dairy alternative, a little bit the same story, except that uh, even China is, uh, is bigger, but we see that Japan uh, is also very important as well, uh, Indonesia is, uh, and Thailand, and, and uh, as well uh, Taiwan. So I will not go in the details of this because it's not the key purpose, but it's just to reassure that the market is still growing. So now I will pass, uh, uh, to Tanya to talk about why is it happening. Yeah, thank you so much, Bridget. So why this is happening? So in Asia, you may already know that actually health benefits are the first priority followed by the safety as supported by the research. From the Global Data Consumer Survey, they said that 66% of Asian consumers would be encouraged to try plant-based alternatives because of health followed by safety and test why the animal welfare and sustainability are just a part of the main reason, but they are not the top priority. So as I mentioned earlier, so health conscious consumers are actually the one who drive the growth for alternative protein in APAC, especially for the top five countries. First, China, second, Thailand, followed by Japan, Singapore, and South Korea. So, but Anyway, therefore, the plant's alternative in APAC is driven by three main reasons. First one is consumer healthy lifestyle, followed by the plant-based or vegan trend from Western country. And lastly, is the increase of a health concern, especially for non-communicable diseases, including uh, and for the diseases and also the interference that is quite apparent in, uh, in Asia. So there is a growing opportunity for plant-based for especially in the flexitarian consumer, they are the one who drive the demand for plant-based alternative in APAC. One fourth of Chinese consumer identify themselves as flexitarian. One third plan to reduce at least one type of meat and 26% of South Korea consumer want to reduce meat consumption. As also evident by the statistic from uh, FHA Insight, they mentioned that the majority group of people who consume plant-based meat are actually the flexitarian with 74% compared to 58% of the traditional meat eater. Alternative protein in Asia start to be crowded by the global and regional brand. So you need to be relevant and differentiated. After the phase of high growth, the market will move to the concentration with winners and losers. Therefore, the challenge for you is how to stand out successfully and maintain a sustainable growth category. So how to make it happen is not, uh, is not the, the heart of our, uh, of our topic. And what we are going to do is to share some uh, 10 winning tips to win an, an alternative protein. This is a 10 winning tip that we, we have identified. I'm not going to describe them now, but I will describe one by one in the, in the following uh, presentation. So the first one is really about where to play. So it's very important to understand what is your playing field before jumping fast on how to grow. Why? Because finding the right market, the right category, will give you the opportunity to find a space to own. So it's about, if I take here the example of plant-based, it's about understanding how to segment the market, how to segment the category. It can be by benefit, it can be by target consumers, and where is the competition, and more importantly, where are the pocket of growth for your brand. So where to play is really the number one. Based on that, you can, based on the market, based on the competition, based on the trend, and of course your capability, it's about defining where to play to unlock the opportunity. So the implication is that you have not to do everything, but you have to do 
you have to have to make choice. So for example, are you another disruptive and activist brand? And this is how are you going to play that? Or will you be a more convenient and mean solution for the conscious consumer? That's different roles to play. So it's why the second uh, marketing tips, it's about target the right consumer needs. So it's about choosing your consumer segment. And more importantly, it's about understanding the triggers and barriers. So our uh, experience on plant-based and protein uh, alternative is that you don't have an average consumer. It's important to understand who are we here for and what are they looking for. So there is because there is not an average, we diff and all these consumers are not open to, to change. So we have defined four types of consumers. The first one is uh, the technology stakeholder. This one has a need for change. For example, you have a bad health condition and will need something for security. For example, you no know, lactose intolerance. The second one is a lifestyle stakeholder. This one is not a need, it's about a want. You won't accept a change and you will go for your innovation and your brands if you are able to fit his attitude and values and his beliefs. The third one is the early mass stakeholders. This guy is very pragmatic. He has to take care of the family. He will accept the change if it makes a sense it makes sense versus daily routine. Is it the right solution to my needs? And finally, the late mass uh, market consumers, which is more reluctant to change, which is uh, very uh, open and want to keep tradition, but also has a problem to, to change. So it's not impossible, but he could, uh, we could make it if we understand these barriers. So now let us go one by one and, and let us see some examples. The first one is the technology stakeholders. So these technology stakeholders has first quite a, a couple of barriers because your solution perhaps is not consumer friendly name. You are quite expensive. You have a long ingredient list and uh, it is not very safe for him to, to make the choice. But on the other hand, if you manage to uh, address uh, the barriers, there is a beautiful triggers and one of them is actually to be able to provide the same taste, same texture, same experience, and to be the best of its kind solution because you can bring nutrition, sustainability, and taste in the same time. Example of that is of a message is around reassuring that we are not only science, we are food, we are not pharma. So we are the best of its kind. We have science which work very closely with nature. And here, if you see this example of uh, cultivated meat, both uh, are very appetizing shots, food shots, uh, reassure about the food ingredients and reassure with the trust um, of the chef. Next is about the activist of the lifestyle. This one has less barrier and very open to uh, positive motivation and triggers. If you are uh, bringing with your uh, brand a real purpose, uh, who fits their ethical beliefs, if you can uh, open as well new experience, a portfolio of new taste, if you can talk about sustainability, not as a green washing, but about regeneration, biodiversity, reuse, reduce, and recycle, this consumer can be the consumer which are the more open to your, uh, to your brand and your story because they don't like uh, what is fake. And for them, it's all about authenticity, authenticity of the ingredients, of authenticity of the nutrients, and because this is a lifestyle to adopt uh, plant-based food or vegetarian food, you can come with real wool plant nutrition story. You can inspire them like that for daily uh, routine and come with new plant menu, not just about an ingredient uh, to adopt. The next one 
It's about the choice, we call it choice Stalin, which is the early mass. As I said before, uh, this one is very much about um, pragmatism. So if you bring something to him which is convenient, versatile, which delivers the taste, the nutrition value, as good as better, they will adopt uh, as the new category. Next. So good example here, it's around the ready to eat menu and ready to eat dish because it's all about drinking versatility and, and convenience and also inspiring them with uh, flavor experience, local flavor experience and local uh, ingredients. Uh, here you see example from different uh, cuisine, uh, Thailand, but also uh, Mediterranean cuisine. And it's interesting to know that Eura, which is in Spain, is not talking about alternative meat, but is talking about I am the successor of meat because I bring things better. So, and the, the last one is the reduce Tarian mass market consumers, where the big barrier is about tradition and, uh, and price, means affordability. But again, if you are able to bring taste and uh, to keep the tradition alive and to that means a good taste and good nutrition and keep familiarity, there is opportunity to convince this consumer as well. So here is, are some examples from Hong Kong and, uh, and Singapore, where we talk about ochre cuisine, we talk about dim sum, we talk about taste and everything that the consumer like, but with um, uh, different type of, uh, of ingredients. And last example in, um, in the mass market is IKEA Singapore, because it's, uh, it's very interesting that uh, they launch actually uh, soya ice cream as a very affordable price, because for this type of consumers, which is already satisfied by the rest, uh, is uh, open to, to change if you give him a hook and price is, uh, is definitely a hook for him, means affordability and accessibility. For the next trip, the trip number three, rather than price, define the right value that consumer will accept to pay. So the right value is mean both for functional and emotional beyond price. Put purpose before the products. Also, there's a quote from Mark Earn in Brand New Brand Thinking that underneath every strong brand should be an idea about how the world should be. Think purpose rather than positioning. This gives a business to move forward but also give the consumer a reason for spending any time at all thinking about you. So let me give you some example here. First one is the only, only bring the purpose behind the science, create a strong brand and target the right consumers. So only the strength of them is the, it's not about the science, but the purpose behind the science. The founder have proposed in the beginning that to develop the better milk that's better for humans and also the planet. Now the scientific background on nutritional value of this plant-based or from oat is also as a supportive reason to believe. And also as you see from the picture on your left-hand side, the, the picture of the cow, the cow where instead of drink milk from the cow, you can drink it directly from the plants or from the oat as the only way. And the packaging that you can see here is the barista milk which is uh, become the first international bridge to only new to the younger generation of consumer. The next brand as uh, Bridget uh, introduced earlier from Spain, be a uh, successor, not just an alternative. This is a plant-based meal that inspired by Mediterranean heritage to create the healthiest 100% plant-based meat and fish. But also they also encourage consumer to join the movement as well. Since the beginning, the brand or the founder also created this brand as a social mission turn business. Empower people to change the current food system to be more sustainable, to be more healthy and nutritious one. Together with the nutritional part, they also encourage consumer to be the food changer in the whole category and the industry as well. Tip number four, bring familiarity with a twist. Make familiarity accessible when you want to move from niche to the mass market. This is one of the very good examples is the Oli from Singapore. It's food for all Asian. 
So as you already know that in Asian cuisine, actually eggs are very common and very important for our cuisine. So this brand bring out the familiarity of the ingredient of the recipe, which is egg, and also the versatility that Asian consumer are uh, feel familiar with. But with a little twist that they bring out the innovation beyond soya. Soya is very uh, used to with uh, common for Asian consumer, but now they made it from legu, which is a uh, high in nutritional value, but also make a innovative aspect in the product as well. Uh, let me give you some more example for these three brand. These three brand also adapt to favorite and Asian local recipe and cuisine. The first one, that pantry from uh, Australia, they are the ready to eat, but they also adapt the recipe to the local original as an Asian plant-based, for example, like the Pad Thai, to propose more localized and versatility beyond the normal plant-based meat. The middle one is the neck meat from Japan. This one also localized, not just only the recipe, but also the taste, the full flat plant flavor as a traditional meat. The last one is Omni Eat from Hong Kong. This one about the cuisine. Since the Xiao Long Bao, this one is an iconic Shanghai dish, but just contain better in nutritional value from plant. The tip number five is the no speed. Don't go retail first, build the partnership. Go to food service first is easily to give consumer and the experience the day that they want and also an opportunity to introduce a new product to consumer in a friendly way. So this example is the good meat. It is a cultivated meat from uh, Singapore. They collaborate with selected chef and restaurant to make this acceptable as a real food. Anyway, the plant outer tea protein is still a food. It's not just a new product that consumer don't feel familiar with. So this product, the good meat, is now actually the, they're available for dying only at a Uber Bristol in Singapore, which is one of the supplier for high quality meat product from them. And this is the place that the, uh, is the first butchery in the world to sell and serve cultivated meat. The next example is the old site. So the brand local uh, is uh, introduced to Asian consumer with the cafe shop and with the collaboration with barista. With the strength of the taste and texture that they claim this is uh, more in a creaminess and maltedness. Multi and the Orsai also actually win many Asian consumers with good taste and great texture to the barista. Another good example is the only in Asia, how they introduce our entry to the Chinese market by the co-branding with local lifestyle brand. First one is the Choco Day. So they uh, bring out the pure old moon cake, targeting the gifting occasion for premium experience. Another brand is very popular, Boba tea brand is, is a hay tea. So they're capturing the lifestyle consumer. The strategy here is that they first target the lifestyle channel. Second, they show the right application for consumer that are Asian consumer uh, used to and are so really like it. So the tip number six is a good uh, give a good reason to switch with this uh, nutrition. Deliver minimum, same, or superior nutritional value for consumer, which consumer can perceive that it's good for them, better for them, and also active for them. Chandi in Singapore is uh, one of the very good example. They compare nutritional value between plant-based and meat. So the, they provide other high-protein uh, vegan meat that are now launched in Singapore and Australia. And they claim that they are the only plant chicken in the world that uh, with the 30% protein content comparable with uh, chicken meat, not just only the protein content, but they also combine uh, different uh, ingredients. For example, from pea protein, chickpea, quinoa, and flax seed, and also bao rice to complete the nutritional value, especially for the essential amino acid that uh, people need. Another tips in this uh in this one is a uh, switch on better nutrition. Not only communicate about the negative, but emphasize on the positive side as well. As you can see, the example here, the meat zero, they mentioned that naturally cholesterol free, and also emphasize on the goodness, which is a high in protein and also source of dietary fiber. 
to get uh, as the same with the you meet as well that they emphasize that uh, not just only the uh, downside, but also very good side that they have a uh, high in protein and also high in fiber, which is uh, superior than the normal meat. The tip number seven, make sustainability closer to people or as a co-benefit. What does the sustainability make to consumer? What if food from Singapore that they pro, uh, produce the plant milk, which is a strong root and strong purpose for a better, better. They target the, have the clear target consumer, which is the Gen Z who drives the normally that the change in the society. They also provide a strong and transparent root inside and regenerative farming practice associated with the BAM nut that they use as the key ingredients. With their strong purpose as well, this brand create last for life to a regenerative principle, which is replenish, restore, and reconnect by turning natural ingredients and regenerative crop into delicious and nutritious food. Not just only that, but they also create the movement among the consumer to join the regeneration. So this is a brand that used as a bring sustainability close to consumer. And Karana, this one also from Singapore, they don't use as the main benefit, but use sustainability as the supportive or the core benefit for to communicate to consumer. The brand actually at the beginning, they emphasize that they have a very good taste and also great texture, but they also communicate that the ingredients that they use with this jackfruit is can also support biodiversity and the farmer as well. Therefore in Asia, brand could introduce sustainability as a core benefit, not, that, not only as a main benefit as a European country or in the US. The tip number eight, tell your story to bond with consumer. How is this connect to me? This is very important in terms of uh, storytelling and communication. I would like to introduce the four types of consumer which is the science, self, heritage and ethic. And among this group of consumer, you also have different type of storytelling or the communication message that you can tell your consumer as well. The first one, the rule of science storytelling. If you are the lab meat brand, for example, like the this example that you see here is a Morsa meat, you should engage with the science driven consumer. The rule of science storytelling is that first, be the expert. Second, set their standard for the category or the industry, but don't hide the fact to consumer and don't underestimate consumer knowledge. This group of consumer will be the one who really like to know what is the technology that you use, what is the process, what is the list of the ingredients that you use. They are very uh, knowledgeable. The second group of consumer and the storytelling that you can say is the self, if you are a pressurable plant-based brand, for example, like the Tinder that focus on the my growing test, so you can engage with this group of consumer. With this rule, first one, care for the individual. Second, encourage the healthy pleasure. But don't ignore people's creativity or the DIY. And don't ignore people's story. Next one is the heritage story. If you are the whole food plant-based brand, for example, like the strong root, as you see the example here, that they emphasize on that product is grown, but not made. And the uh, uh, rule to play for heritage storytelling here is that, first, grow innovation in tradition. Second, tell a story, but don't hide the origin and don't ignore cultural and historical context. The last group of consumer is the ethic. So if you are the activist brand, for example, like the what if that uh, I introduced to you earlier that they encourage the regeneration uh, principle. So the root of ethic storytelling that you can play here is that first be transparent for the whole ecosystem. Do take step after step, but don't ignore the global future and don't ignore the connection between food and politics. So I will continue with uh, number nine, which is uh, choose one of the five entry strategy which work. 
So when we talk about uh, entry strategy, market entry strategy, is it's very critical for making your innovation a success. So what we see sometimes is the speed to enter in too many channels, to enter, to have too many uh, points of uh, market entry. And at the end, there is less focus, no velocity. We don't know who are, who are our competitors and we need to reset uh, the project. So it's why we, I would like to introduce a different type of market entry strategy. So if you are in a very much in a disruption technology innovation, the job to be done will be really to create a new category. If you are more in a lifestyle uh, approach where you bring something uh, different and differentiated, you are going here. The job to be done will be how to explain what is this new segment in the category. And if you are in a market or in, with your brand uh, already in an early mass, what we call the new normal, you could offer different approach. Either you are a full category substitution because uh, you are better. If you are not better, but you have competitive advantage so you can leverage your, uh, for example, your hidden nutritional assets. And of course, be the replacement of food, which is a me too um, strategy. So let us see some example behind this uh, five one. The new category creation is um, example is a cultivated meat when you have a cutting edge science, but you need to you need to um, fit a market needs because consumer, as you saw from these eight points, are not buying a science; they are buying a solution to a problem. The second uh, approach, which is a new segment in category, is for example, if you are developing a new ingredient in existing category, or if you are leveraging new format, or you are leveraging new occasion, means you find another new space that you want to own uh, in this uh, lifestyle, uh, I would say, uh, categories. The number three, uh, it's about really a category substitution because you bring something which is better in terms of taste, better in terms of, of nutrition, and it's a, and it starts to be accessible. A good example here is Oira from Spain. And by the way, <laughs> they don't talk about substitution. They talk about replacement. They talk about um, a, a world which is more re substitution replaced for, uh, forever. So it's about with, uh, swapping without uh, compromise. The so number four is uh, leveraging hidden nutritional assets. This is uh, the example here uh, we saw with Tanya, where they highlight the nutrition value and the health benefits. So it's not only about free from, it's about tell me the positive and why I should uh, embrace this uh, new innovation. And finally, the Me Too strategy is a new normal. So the key point here is to be uh, accessible, but it doesn't mean that you have to be only mass. You can also have some competitive age in terms of, uh, of taste and nutrition, but here you keep uh, the tradition uh, alive and the familiarity. So the point number 10 will be how to remain competitive and how to grow. That's an important one. Because uh, to remain competitive and to grow, there is actually two strategies, there is two options. And it's not about playing these two options together, because as we explained to you today, or uh, learning from this category is that there is not one consumer, but there are different types of consumer with different barriers and motivation. So if you focus on the lifestyle, uh, you are uh, actually focusing on building a strong premium niche brand rooting in purpose. So you need to stay true to your purpose, to your values as a brand. You can grow your product portfolio within this premium niche. And if you decide to expand internationally your geography, it's about rolling out within the same premium niche. You can work with influencer and you can invest and you need, unfortunately, also to invest heavily in marketing and communication. So it's why 
premium means not only in terms of price, but it's also in terms of differentiation and aspiration. On the other hand, if you decide your uh, brand, your category, you decide to work and to play in the mass market because you want to increase quickly the sales and reach uh, a wider, uh, uh, I would say, audience, this means different rules of the games because they are they are changing. You must understand the mass market uh, consumer triggers and barrier that we that we explained at the beginning. But don't forget that Asia is not one continent, but every country has different uh, local habits and taste habit. That's why it's complicated and complex. You need to develop new products that cater the needs. For example, convenience is, uh, is and uh, versatility is very important. And in this mass market game, I would say that health and taste are far more important than ethical consideration. And you need very importantly as well to adjust your price because if you price your product is considered that too expensive, you will not be able to attract uh, the reduced Syrian consumers and to enter in the mass market. So affordability and accessibility are quite uh, important. So in conclusion and some uh, takeaway, you see that uh, we presented today, we introduced 10 expert winning tips on alternative protein success in Asia. The one, number one, is about understanding your playing field before jumping how to grow. It's all about opportunity space and segmentation. The number two is about in your market, based on your purpose, target the right consumer needs. We saw that there are different types of consumers. Be sure that who you want to target. Number three is about define the accepted value. The value for consumers is not only functional, but it's also emotional. It's about the hook that you create with the consumer. Number four is familiarity uh, with a twist because you can innovate, but still keep familiarity to, uh, to gain uh, scale. Number five is don't go to retail first. Test and learn from uh, food service, from your partners, your uh, your barista approach and everything that can exist in your in your category uh, with the ambassador really really uh, go there. Number six, it's about uh, to make consumer adopt uh, and move step by step on uh, on mass market. Make sure that you can bring something which is minimum same or superior nutrition for people to switch. Number seven is we know that sustainability is not the main driver uh, yet in Asia compared to Europe, but make sustainability as a reason to believe or as a co-benefit, depending on what is your, uh, your story and, uh, and your conviction. Number eight, it's uh, very important to tell a story and a narrative. You are not selling a product, you are selling an experience. And Tanya explained uh, four types of strategy around that. Number nine is uh, choose uh, the right market uh, strategy. You cannot be at the same time everywhere. So you need to choose your battles and, and put your investment behind. And number 10 is about how to stay competitive and grow the brand. It's about having a roadmap, having a vision, and making a choice if you want to continue to be a prime, premium lifestyle, premium niche, or if you want to enter more as a, as a mass market uh, market, yeah. So thank you for uh, for listening. So we share these uh, ten tips. We can you can have more information on the mass market uh, trigger and barriers uh, consumers by downloading uh, this uh, this QR code. And you can find as well more case studies as well here. So we finish uh, our part around uh, sharing. And now if you have some question, we will be happy to uh, to answer to your question and, and uh, engage in a, in a conversation. Yeah, okay. So thank you so much, Bridget and Tanya for your very detailed and informative presentation. I really like how you use a lot of the examples to showcase to us. Um, so that we understand like not just the points yeah 
so now we will start our Q&A session. Um, and this time on, we, we I want to do a little bit of a different format. So um, I saw that there are a few questions. I'll let the participants, I gave them the talking permission. So we can start with the, the first question by Ming Yi. Ming Yi, if you would like, um, you can unmute yourself and then you can actually ask your question directly. Sure. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, this, perfect. This is me um, based out of Bangkok as well. Um, so I'm curious about, um, so in APAC, there's lots of early stage startups. So they're pre-seed, um, just kind of building up the ideas. So if, if a company is still trying to refine their sciences and products, so for example, a cultivated company, um, at what point of their product development cycle should they think about their branding, marketing strategies, and how much should they invest in it? So I think, uh, Mingi, it's very important to think about it at the beginning. Why? Because what you want to do, at the, even if you are early stage, you want to solve a problem. You want to solve a problem for a type of consumers and very quickly. So now I'm talking not marketing, but I'm talking uh, funding. Mm -hmm. People are going to tell you, okay, it's another cultivated meat. It's another cultivated uh, whatever uh, uh, fish, etc. What would be your differentiation versus what exists uh, in the market? Because, and if for that, you have to, to think about as an owner or as a founder, what is the, your purpose? And consequently, how, what you would like to communicate to your, um, to your consumers. Why? Because when you develop science, you develop also recipes, right? Mm -hmm. And product and cost. <laughs> Cost is very important. And not all the driver of cost are meaningful for the consumer. So you need, if you have to make, um, I would say, to say, what do I need to must keep and what I, it's nice to have and must have, you will need to understand to who you want to target. Mm -hmm. okay. So you don't need to spend a lot of money at this stage, but you need to, to define really your value proposition and also your branding. Okay, mm. thank you. And also just uh, add a little bit from Bridget. I think that is a cultivated myth that you see is more in the technology stakeholder and the market of plant base in Bangkok. I'm not sure where you would like to uh, continue with your business or the product, but in Bangkok or in Thailand or most part of the Asian country as well, is uh, more or less in the early mass that uh, fo everyone focus about the health or nutrition. So I think it's also very good to think at the beginning, at this stage, at what is your advantages or what is your unique selling point or and be transparent with a consumer as well and invest a little bit with the education. And definitely uh, you need to shoot who is your target consumer as Bridget mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so then we have another question. This is by Diana. So I'll let Diana, um, if you're interested to, you can ask the question directly. Yeah, Diana, if you want, you can. Uh, if not, I can ask the question for you as well. I, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes, okay, yes, we can, can hear you. Me. Yeah, yeah, um yeah, Diana here, Singapore. So uh Bridget and uh Tanya, uh thank you for the great insights. Just would like to take your and top onto your um brains here because of the inflation, right? And we're talking about Southeast Asia, given that Singapore is uh, situated in a better place in terms of um buying power and whatnot of um the consumer, but still something part of the barrier of entering to a plant base is actually the consumer purchasing um ability mm -hmm. so in terms of the the cost right it's really high if you see it on the shelf um in in the groceries right so how to actually market it in terms of um price point mm. because there are a lot of alternatives or they can just go back to the traditional meat yeah so uh, you see the point number nine i was talking about uh, market entry yeah so yeah. If you 
target the lifestyle consumers, for them, the price is uh, less important because what's more important is uh, is what you offer, your purpose, right? They mm -hmm. are vegetarian or they have strong ethic uh, values, so they don't mind to pay a little bit more if what you do is great, yeah? And you deliver. So, and, and you can... These guys, probably, they don't always do shopping in retail, you see? They can uh, be on e-commerce, direct to consumer, and this is where you can do uh, promotion things, subscription, encourage their uh, loyalty. <laughs> uh, and okay. in this case, it's not about price, it's about getting the value, yeah? Mm. So if you are in, uh, in retail, I would say it's uh, as everywhere in, uh, in retail, you have to think about who is my competitor? Is uh, my competitor uh, a big plant-based brand, right? And what is my price index versus this? Or is it dairy? Because if you are too expensive, it's true that you have a gap. And if your consumer look at the pack and they don't see what is your added value in terms of nutrition, uh, I'm not talking about taste now because it's about the first moment of truth when they find you, they, they will not buy you. So it's why... The, the tips very often is to really uh, to create a purchase uh, and penetration because you have a, a, I would say a voucher, a promotion. You, and what we know from FNCG a lot is sampling. Sampling is super important. Uh, of course, it's a cost, but if you, you are uh, sure about your product uh, and it tastes great, you know, if people like it, uh, and uh, during this promotion day, you give uh, a little bit uh, a discount. You have a, a good chance to uh, to uh, gain uh, and acquire new uh, new consumers. But again, it's more tactics about promotion. But the price is very important, as we say. It doesn't play the same role when you are in mass market because it's a must-have if you are in mass market. Is less important for uh, the lifestyle consumers, but uh, it's true that it can be uh, an important barrier. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Just to add a little bit as well from a uh, Bridget point, I think another thing that uh, maybe uh, if you see the tip number ten from Bridget, we divided uh, quite obviously that uh, there are one lifestyle and mass uh, lifestyle is focused less on the price. If you have the very high cost already in your product, but uh, you are so sure that you have a good quality as well, I think it's very important to invest in doing the branding and communication and set yourself as a premium brand. Because mm. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, in Southeast Asia, we are, or in Asia, we have, if you are there, go to the retail or to the restaurant, there are the level of uh, that, uh, like the premium supermarket the normal supermarket and maybe the low price supermarket. So the strategy for the uh, premium, that one you also need to communicate or invest in the value, not just only functional. Functional is mean more uh, health benefit or nutrition, but also invest in communication about the mm -hmm. emotional benefit as well, which is uh, could be the, okay, consumer can feel good about themselves and they buy this product or they feel that they are caring with themselves and or they are a part of a change in the society. Yeah, or they are this part of a community or they are part of a community. Hmm. Yes. The ethical aspect as well. Okay, sure. So market penetration, it is more now of a focus differentiation, right? Because mm -hmm. what we are selling is targeting the lifestyle. Thank you so much. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have what we have um a few more questions. One is, I'll let uh, Antonio submit a question. I'll let him speak. Or if it, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hello to everyone. Could you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Well, thanks a lot for the presentation. This is Antonio Vendrell from uh, BioVerica, Spain. I was just curious about your recommendation in terms of uh, communication to the target, to the consumer target. I understand uh, mostly would be brand communication, direct to consumer. However, I'd like to know your opinion in terms of other prescribers or influencers that could influence on the on the consumer buying decision. Um, would that depend on the market, the type of category, 
is your recommendation to focus mainly on the direct to consumer or or what's what's your hold on that it's a, it's a good question but very very broad antonio i think uh, what we learn in uh, to grow a category to make it alone is, is very hard because you need uh, you need resource so if you have a partnership if you have influencer uh, people or key opinion leaders, it is very helpful because these people can communicate uh, for you, you know, your uh, your brand and your story, and put you uh, and they can be as well an accelerator of trust and uh, as well awareness means and as well commun uh, message. Um, an example of that is, for example, in a in the baby baby or healthy aging category, right? You have always a doctor or key opinion uh, leader like uh, KOL, et cetera, who help you to communicate through symposium, conference. And this is where you, you build your expertise uh, as a brand through this influencer. In this case, it's about uh, doctors. If you are a, a brand which wants to be more on the lifestyle, for example, like uh, activists or uh, or uh, people, who are change maker people, you you could uh, play as well with this influencer, which have a huge community. So you can talk to directly to consumer, of course, because the consumer has different touch points, huh? uh, and and around the touch point, you you can uh, reach the consumer many times. But the, the role of the influencer, the role of the ambassador is quite important. And you see in the food, we saw we saw some examples as well in Singapore and Asia with B2B or, or uh, food service. Many companies are also working with the chef, right? So the chef has also his own, a part of the fact that he brings in being trust and great taste and thank you for them. But it's also they have their own community, so it, it creates trust. So all recommendation based on um, what is your um, uh, vision, mission, and strategy is to identify the right partnership to amplify uh, your trust and amplify your message. But digital <laughs> marketing for you with young people works very well nowadays. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have one final question. This is by this anonymous attendee, but you can, if you are the anonymous person, you can ask your question. Um, if not, I will ask it for you. Okay, so maybe I'll go ahead and ask the anonymous question. So the, the question that they submitted is, what are the food industries that are the most open or they show the most promising commitment to change from animal meat to plant-based that uh, we should focus first in the APAC countries. I didn't get the question. Can you repeat? Oh, yeah. So what are some of the food industries, maybe it could be fast food or it could be salad or I don't know, frozen food, that they are the most open or they are most committed to change from animal meat to plant-based meat? Mm. Um, I, I think... Uh... It's true, first, I just in principle, that um, in Asia, uh, there is a commitment from uh, Oreca, and especially for meat, it's about uh, the menu. Uh, for example, the hospitality uh, things, Oreca hospitality, because some big players in the market, they have a target to be by 2030, it's like Singapore, by 2030, 30% of their uh, menu should be plant-based. So if we go to this uh, engage, uh, I would say company, big company or regional company in hospitality can be uh, hotel, restaurants, because there is a lot of many tourists here in, in, in Asia. So uh, introducing more plant-based uh, menu will be their uh, their their big opportunity and their strategy. That's number one. The second one, it's around the uh, functionality. If you look at another uh, important um, channel in Asia, it's uh, the coffee shop. And coffee shop is where people drink coffee, tea, 
And we saw that uh, with oats and oat, oat milk, etc., it's a perfect uh, addition in terms of creaminess, mouthfeel, mouthfeel to coffee and tea, right? So here it's not about so much about sustainability. It's about bringing choice uh, to the consumers because the young consumers, they will go to this coffee shop and they will look for something which is um, more sustainable. So I will say this is more uh, offline. And after uh, another one, but it's more complicated, is perhaps around uh, school because education of young consumers is very important. We saw today that it's generation dead, which are driving uh, the change, right? Uh, and we, today I talk on, only about uh, adults, but if we manage to educate the young generation at school already about what is uh, the future of food, I think all the people who are uh, providing food to the school uh, can be also uh, uh, help out the change. Okay, great. Yeah, I think those are really good answers. Um, and just, I just leave the floor. Does anyone else have one more question? You, I think I let everyone speak so you can unmute yourself if you want. So just give 10 seconds. If not, I will wrap it up. Uh, yes, this is uh, smart. Uh, uh, just want to add some question regarding the education of the markets here. So wondering, uh, first question is wondering how can uh, alternative proteins uh, players here can help each other to educate the markets here in Apex because comparing to the Europe, I think we are now quite early in terms of the knowledge about the alternative proteins. Uh, secondly, in terms of the regulations uh, and uh, registration of Apex countries, which are the which countries are the most uh, countries that uh, international players should be looking at in terms of the regulations. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I, I will start by uh, number two of your question for regulations. It really depends uh, about uh, what is your product, right? But I will say uh, that Singapore is very open. Thailand, Tanya, I think it's uh, it's quite open as well, right? Mm -hmm. Tanya, yeah, Thailand, uh, Hong Kong, uh, it's also open. So I think if you are an international player and you want to go to Asia, uh, I, I will start by uh, the more advanced market uh, in terms of uh, plant base, as uh, Thailand, as um, uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan. And uh, Thailand, Japan as well. And Japan and, and uh, yeah, but I don't China, know. The, yeah. yeah, but I don't know uh, Japan and China in terms of regulation. Uh, it should be possible, but if you are interested by that, we we can have a, a conversation. And your second question is about how to grow a category. I think it's a very good question because today it's about joining. It's about uh, like Good Food Institute is doing, right? It is not about working as a silo. It's about finding uh, an, e an ecosystem where uh, everyone works in the same direction. For example, if it's about educating consumer, why not having, uh, uh, I would say, professor or uh, people educating about uh, what is the importance of to have a balanced diet and uh, to have a more sustainable uh, approach to your, uh, to your nutrition. Because you know that we have malnutrition, but you have also overnutrition. And uh, so that's about education. And the ecosystem, you can have uh, partners for uh, consumers uh, at the industry level. It can be with uh, university and, and teacher. It can be conference. So there is a lot of uh, way to work together. I think when you start from a, a new category, you need to be very courageous, very resilient, have a, a strong <laughs> stamina to grow alone. So why not to join, you know, education of the category is a benefit for everybody. There is no competition. 
it's like uh, the enabler, right? But after that, of course, you have the competitive advantage versus the other brands and your and your competitors where you want to create your differentiation. But anyway, the space of plant based is so big <laughs> in Asia that there should be an open space uh, for everybody. Okay. All right. So I think in the interest of time, uh, this will come to the end of our Q&A session. But of course, if you have any other questions, you can always reach out to Tanya or Bridget as well. So I want to really thank Tanya and Bridget for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And also thank you to everyone who has joined us for the webinar. And we will have a feedback form at the end of the webinar that you can fill up. So please fill it up so we know whether how you find the session and whether we should host more of such sessions. Um, also, I mean, if you want to get more support for your company or talk about how to collaborate together on marketing for the whole category, um, GFI is happy to help and help support the whole industry. So just reach out to me at valeriep at gfi.org. Um, I will also put my email in the chat so you can always follow up with me afterwards um, so I think with that I want to thank everyone um, and hope you find this webinar useful and have a good day ahead thank you everyone bye-bye thank you okay bye, -bye. bye.